Um, so today, uh, my name is Michelle Olson. I'm here to introduce our speaker for, for today, Dr. Hen Wang. Um, he comes to us from Caltech. I'm going to give you just a little bit of his background. So he got his bachelor's degree in biological sciences and biotechnology in Tsinghua, yeah, in Beijing in 2007. Um, he received his PhD in 2013 from the University of Southern California, and his degree was in gen genetic and molecular and cellular biology. Um, his thesis work uh, focused, uh, demonstrated that neuropeptides from pacemakers can act as classic neurotransmitters and convey timing by directly activating motor neurons through uh, the typical GPCR um, 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 cyclic AMP PKA pathway. Um, to control ultra-radian rhythmic behavior, which is a behavior that happens on more than a 24-hour cycle. Um, and this work was in C. elegans. Um, his his, his pre-doctoral work was supported by an NIH fellowship. Since his uh, PhD, he's been at Caltech um, working with Dr. Paul Sternberg. Um, he's been there since 2014, and he's investigating how sleep is regulated at both a molecular and cellular level using um, genetic tools such as CRISPR and RNA sequencing um, and manipulating behavior in C. elegans. His long-term goals are to understand conserved mechanisms underlying sleep and behavior, which everybody does, but we don't really understand the molecular underpinnings of that. Um, his work has been published in journals such as PNAS, PLOS Genetics, Nature Methods, and Journal of Neuroscience. And he currently holds a K99 from NIH. So with that, uh, welcome to Virginia, to, to Virginia Tech. It's a bit cold here. The title of his talk is Genetic and Neural Dissection of Sleep in C. elegans. So can I turn this off now? Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for a nice introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, to present my work. But by the way, can you all hear me clearly and even in the back? Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about my work to understand how sleep is regulated or controlled using a very simple model system, C. elegans. And so as a human, we, we all sleep. We spend about a third of the time in sleeping, but not only we sleep. Actually, sleep is a very evolutionary conserved behavior that has been uh, observed in many uh, animals. For example, uh, I mean, humans sleep, mouse sleep too, uh, fish, birds sleep too. Uh, even invertebrate like Drosophila, worms, and even jellyfish, actually they undergo sleep as well. And sleep, while they are different in, in kind of different in the in different animal in the sense how when when the time the the animal uh, start to sleep, how long they sleep, and it's kind of different. But the sleep behavior in, across the animal kingdom all share some common features. And these features include when animals sleep, they generally go into an inactive state or behavioral quiescence. So generally the, one don't, uh, generally the animal will not move. And when animals sleep, they also have an increased drought, uh, drought, uh, arousing threat hold. So imagine if you touch a sleeping cat, the cat might not notice this. But when they're awake, they probably just run away or something like that, right? But sleep is not just, it's not a hibernation or a torpor, but so sleep is a rapid reversal, it's rapid reversal state. So if the stimulus is strong enough, you will, will wake up like, like, to, like today morning, the alarm just waking you up even though it's a long, after a long flight. So, and lastly, one of the most characteristic feature of sleep is, is under, under homeostatic regulation. That means you would deprive of sleep you all make up for it by either sleep longer or by deeper. Okay, so this this features now kind of define the sleep in, in uh, along the, the evolutionary uh, path. And this common features of sleep suggesting there are probably some common concern mechanisms that control this behavior across evolution. And it also implies that sleep probably doing something very important that is get preserved across. But we actually, but actually, sleep remains one of the most intriguing, intriguing mysteries in, in biology because we don't know much about it. More specifically, we don't know how does a brain make an organism into a sleep state, or what are the nerve system is required, or how does the how, how does the nerve system 
switching between these two states. And the other question is, what other gene in our genome actually control, contribute to the, the generation of sleep states are unclear either. And more importantly, what, are the, what sleep actually do, we actually don't know. We, we feel good after sleep, but actually we don't know exactly what sleep is doing. So, and these are all, com these are very complex questions, and that's why we don't know much about it. And so when I, so I decided to use a very simple model system that we could start to get into this, uh, get answer into these questions. And the model I use is C again, as you can see here. And this C again is also one, uh, only one millimeter long, just tiny, with around a thousand cells total. And even though it's so small, the genome is actually con contain roughly the same gene as we human do. It's about 20,000 genes. Uh, and 40% of those are conserved. Um, and the, the other feature of this, this uh, tiny animals is that it have a very powerful genetics. The life cycle is only three days. It's homeopathized. So you could, you could examine a lot of animals in a very short period of time, which I'll show you later. And it has contribu contributed to be the identification of many genes involved in a lot of important biological processes, including neural development, behavior control, and for example, RNA or cell program death. And most importantly is that it have a very simple nervous system, only 302 neurons, at a scale that is small enough that we might be able to understand the sleep at a single cell level that we could assess to each of the neurons. But despite the simple nervous system, the worm actually using exactly the same neurotransmitter as what you do, like the acetylcholine, GABA, or glutamate to control a variety of different behavior, including, as you see here, the worm moving and they are eating, and they also sleep too. And so when worms are under stress, they don't move, they don't eat, and they'll wake up when you poke them. So the worm will wake up, move around, but they're sleepy, so they get back to sleep again. And all anim animal that does not get uh, disturbed, they all stay just in the sleep-like state. So, right, so it's a cool video, right? Um, so besides the, the stress-induced sleep, uh, this uh, worm could also sleep in uh, two, at least two uh, uh, contexts. So during development, the worm will sleep at a certain period of time, which is rhythmic. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, matching to the molti molting cycle of the worm. And like human, once you have, after a big meal, you feel sleepy, the worms feel the same thing too. So there's a society induced sleep. And all these three sleep like behaviors all share the same common um, uh, behavioral, quiescent, uh, behavioral phenotype I described earlier. So they don't move. They are re quick reversible. They they have they, they stop stop eating, and they have a, a, re a reduced sensory response. And then in the rest of my talk, I'm going to just focus on only single one of the single this path one of the single pathways for for the sleep regulation, because this is, is easy to induce it, and the molecule mechanism is much simpler in this sense, and. What happens is that when the worm are under stress, which including give them a brief heat shock or cold shock or other type of stress, you will activate a single molecule, the epidermal growth factor, EGF. And this, this uh, signal will act on a single neuron in the entire worm uh, nerve system, uh, we call AOA neurons. It's a neuroendocrine cells that, as you can see here, it, it, it's a cell body in the head, and then it extends two very long axons along the whole, whole, whole worm. And it, this kind of primary is a good position how it could coordinate the whole, behavior, the whole state of the worm. So once this, act, this neuron is activated, it, it somehow pries the worm into a steep state. But we don't know what actually is happening down, down there. And the second feature why we want to, I, I would like to study this process is because the sleep promoting effect of this, GP, uh, this EGF is conserved. And it has been observed in not just worm, but in flies, in zebrafish, and in mice as well. Is that also in response to a stress 
Uh, for fish, they are collaborators think, think they are. But in humans, uh, in mammals, ma ma that's, that's, uh, that's, that's well known, but it's the EGFs kind of, uh, is, uh, the expression kind of synchronized with uh, the circadian, so that might contribute why we sleep at a particular time. Uh, any questions so far? So, good. So then, use this paradigm, I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. One is try, I will tell you how sleep is regulated by normal neural peptide signal pathways that I, I identify. And second, I'll, I'll talk about a genetic tool that, that I developed that will allow me to do systematic uh, circuit dissection in the worm. And I'll spend the last few minutes talking about a future direction, a few future directions I would like to take. So for the first part, then we ask the question, what are the signals from this single cell that prime the worm into a sleep state? Well, the way that the, I, the, to answer this question, the way we approach this is that I work with a graduate student in the lab, and then we do RNA sequencing on this single cell to know what our gene is expressed. And to do so, we, so this is a worm, it's hard to see, but we can label just the AOA neuron with a GLP reporter, as you can see here, and we could dissect the worm and, and isolate this single, single cells. And we, by combining by combine this single cell, we could do uh, RNA-seq. <coughs> and from this experiment, we find this cell expressed about 8,000 genes. How many cells do you do? Excuse me? I think this one is probably, I think the, the student isolated is probably like 10, 10 to, to, 10, 10 to 15, yeah. I said, how experiment, so, but now there's a better way to do it too. You don't need to do, do by physically isolate a single cell, you could do it by, by label the, the RNA or label the poly binding proteins. And so this cell expresses about 8,000 genes. Each one represents by a dot here. Um, so the y-axis represents the, the abundance of each gene in the AOA neuron. And the x-axis, we basically try to get how the, the enrichment of each, each gene relative to the whole, the transcription of whole, whole, of all, of whole animals. So the gene on this upright corner will be the most interesting one because they are expressed very high level and also very specific in this neuron. That will make probably the better uh, uh, candidate that we are looking for. And in particular, you can see a lot of color dot here. Those are all neuropeptide genes. And if, uh, so here, at least the, the f most four, most uh, abandoned one is this here, FRIP24, FRIP7, FRIP13, and then NLP8. And so what are neuropeptide genes? So they are secrete neuromodulators, uh, and they generally, generally synthesize as a long precursor, but they all get processed, and the mature peptide will store in a, a, a small, it's an organelle called dense core vesicle in the, vesicle, uh, in, the, in the cell, and this vesicle will undergo exocytosis when the cell gets stimulated, and the peptide will release, diffuse in the long distance, and activate the target cell by binding to their receptors and the receptor generates G-protein coupled receptors. And the, the, key, the feature of this is that it is very different from the local action of classic neurotransmitter where they generally just uh, work in the synaptic region. So this feature of neuropeptide make it very promising candidate for the sleep molecule that we are looking for from, from the AOA cell. And so through a, a, a serious genetic analysis, I'm not gonna show it today here, we find out of the four most enriched peptides, three of those, FIP13, FIP24, and NLP8, uh, collectively and redundantly mediate a lot of uh, this behavior, but not complete, but majority of it. Uh, but how does that doing so, we don't know. What's the downstream molecular or circuit mechanism, we don't know. And today my talk is gonna be focused on just one of it, uh, the FIP24, and tell you what the receptor for this and how does it control more specifically the locomotion quiescent during sleep. And why I picked this gene? Because it's the most highly expressed and most, uh, most enriched gene. 
as, as confirmed by the transcription reporter here, where I used the indulgent promoter of FRIP24 to drive the, G, the, the expression of GAP. We can see it's pretty much in a single cell very brightly. So we can see it by eye directly by looking at worms. Is that expression in response to your stressor? Or no, it's just in under basal, basal conditions. Okay. So, so what's this gene? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a peptide belonging to the epimyamide family, which have a character, characteristic C terminal with the RF amide after processing, which is, this is reported to be very important, is important for the peptide function. And so I make an inactive version of this peptide by mutating this RF to aniline. So this will be a, a control peptide I'll be used a lot during the, during the rest of my talk. And because the redundancy happening of all the peptides from that single, mo single cell, we, the, the loss of function data actually is pretty weak because of the redundancy. So to approaching how does this cell doing their work, I take a gain of function approach. In this sense, I make a change in where now I express the Y type, FRIT24 Y type cDNA, pen neuronally, so this, this signal is always constant on. The worm is getting, always getting into a quiescent state. And this, this is depend on the, this mature peptide, the, 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 the activity of this peptide, because if we do a control, now doing exactly the same genetic manipulation, but now overexpress an inactive FRIP24, then, then the worm will, will have a wide type movement. Question? So is it this now being expressed in all 300 neurons? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, because in this way, we want to max out, maximum out the, 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 the effect of this peptide, and this will allow me to dissect the downstream uh, molecule pathways. And you can see how I do it in the part. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so, this, so because this, pep, this peptide, this pep, this pep, this pep belongs to the RFA my peptide, and the RF is like, the, this family is defined by these two critical residues. And so in mutated basically, you, you kind of, uh, kind of blocking their signatures. So it presumably it's to be inactive. Yeah. Okay. So you can see this difference by looking at this video. So this is a wild type animal. The way we do this assay quickly is that we put the worm in the center of the plate. And the wild type will move and disperse very quickly. Out of, they are constantly moving in general. But the, the change in that have the peptide overexpressed, basically they just stay where they are. They don't move out at all. And this control worm, they're pretty much doing like the same as the white type animal, just move out uh, very quickly. Okay. So now the question is, then this presumably this peptide once is released from the nerve system, it's probably acting on a receptor in somewhere in the target cells so that it make the worm into a sleep uh, in, a, in a quiescent state. So then I reason that if we could mutate this receptor, which at this point we don't know, then the target cells should not respond to, to the, the signal. And so the worm should basically have a wide type movement, right? But what, what gene out of the 20,000 gene actually is the receptor? How are you going to find it, all right? So this is where the genetic of worm becomes super powerful, that we could get this done very quickly. And I'll walk you through how we do it. So I mutagenize the parent strain of the worm, that the strain gene I built that don't move with EMS to in in induce DNA mutations in their genome. And because worm are hermaphrodites, so they could do the self uh, uh, cross. So with that, the the first generation, if there's a mutation, it would be a heterozygous because you can't get a homozygous right away. So we basically let it go for two generations. And in the F2 generation, we're looking for suppressors that have wide type movement so that one will move out easily. And to give an idea how efficient we could do this in worm, is that I work this with a technician in a lab. We spend two weeks, we screen thousand, thousand, tens of thousands of animals that totally representing uh, 25,000 genomes, and this means it covers the genome ten, at least 10, to, uh, 200, uh, 10 to 20 times. And from with, within this, this short amount of time, we get six suppressors 
that I will show you in a mess. How does that look? So basically, they, they look like Y type, as you could appreciate that in this uh, movie, where now this, again, on the left is the original parent strain I used to mutagenize. And the right will be the one that we get from the screen. So all six, uh, here I show you one, all the six are like this way. So this is cool, so that we, we are, we are we're pleased, and we are, get, we are very excited when, after we do this in the mapping, we find all the six mutations are hitting exactly the same gene. It's called flipper in this case. And as you can see, every, every, every mutation, every mutant have a different mutation in the either coding sequence or the, the splicing site, which presumably make this protein uh, inactive, a uh, loss of function. So, and this is our, the only gene we get. This gene is a uncharacterized gene, so we know nothing about it, but based on the protein sequence, we predict, it is predicted to be a semen transmitted protein, maybe a GPC, but I might show it, I try to convince you later on it's actually not. But the fact that we could get only this, this receptor, I mean this uh, protein, suggesting very likely to be the candidate for a receptor. So in order to, un to under understand what other cell actually respond to the FRT24, uh, we do uh, the analysis of the expression of this uh, gene. And the way we do again is using the transcription reporter where we could clone the Pomora regime, put it in front of a GAP. We see this with this gene mostly expressed in the big muscle cells, as, as shown here like this, and like 10 to 15 cells in the head region of the worm, which represents about less than 5% of the nerve system. And there are a couple of like very weak motor neurons that control those muscles. So now there are two models. The peptide might actually inhibit the muscle so that one don't move. But it could inhibit, alternatively, it could be inhibiting the neurons too. Or it could be both. So to test this, we, I, we did a, a tissue special rescue experiment. So now if, we, if I put the Y-type copy of this receptor back just into the muscle, so every, everywhere else is a mutant, but now the flipper is only in the muscle. Now this worm, now it rescues. So the worm getting back to the quiet sense state, unlike the suppressor we get. And we do the, the complementary experiment. We now put uh, neuronal special rescue. We see in the same thing. So the one also get back into the quiescent state. And this is kind of surprising in the sense that the, 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 the peptides, the, the receptor only express a limited amount of, of neurons. But anyway, it seems like this signal is sufficient to shut down either a neuron or a muscle to make a worm into a quiescent state. But how does it do in cell? So in, at, the, at the cellular level. So to, to answer this question, now we do electrophysiology on the worm by patching, by opening up the worm and patching on the muscle. It shows the electro here. And then now we, we will use a, a different electro to locally apply the mature peptide a synthesized peptide and see what the muscle responds. And this, this, this is a very challenging experiment, and we do so by a very great collaboration with Ping and Zhao Wen at the University of Connecticut. And the, 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 the answer is actually very clear, is that the FRIP24 actually induce an inhibitory current in the muscle. Uh, so to walk you through what the data look like, is a, so this is a Y-type animals with the FRIT per plus. If we apply the control peptide, the inactive peptide, we don't see any current. Those are, uh, we don't see any current. If we now switch to apply the peptide, the mature peptide, we see a current of uh, outward inhibitory current in the muscle. So that will shut down the muscle. And this current is gone in the, now if we mutate this receptor. And we could rescue it in the muscle, now it, the current is getting back. But you can notice that the amplitude is much bigger, and that's because the, the, the promoter we use to do the rescue is much stronger than the indulgent promoter. And when we characterize this 
occurring more carefully, indeed, we could find this peptide actually induce a dose-dependent uh, increase of the current it could generate with an EC50 around uh, 8.6 micromolar. So when we look at this trace more carefully by zooming in, we find something very interesting in that the latency, which we define as the time we apply the, the, the peptide to the time we see the, this current coming up, is so it's very short from range from 10 to 15 milliseconds across all, all the concentration we tested. And this is surprising in the sense that, in general, neuropeptide acting through a G-protein couple of receptors. And that means it takes the peptide activated G-protein couple of receptors, and it will activate a G-protein, and then probably secondary messenger, and eventually couple to a ion channel that leads to the current happening. And because of the multiple step a cascade, it will generally take a long time, in general at least 200 milliseconds or longer. But this is not what you see. A different scenario that the peptide, they say, or oh, maybe a ligand could directly bind to an ion channel, where it will directly open the ion, uh, the channel so the ion can flow through to get a current. And in this case, it's much faster. And the fact that the latency we are seeing here is very similar to the ligand-gated ion channel, we make a very wild speculation that, that maybe this fripper is actually a ligand-gated ion channel rather than a seven-transmembrane seven, seven G-protein G couple receptor as the sequence predicted. Uh, so if this, if this hypothesis is correct, we make the following two predictions. First is that the, the effect of this fripper FRIP24 does not depend on G-protein uh, G-protein signal because it's not G it, it's not go to G-proteins. And the second, if we reconstitute this signal in a headlock system that don't have anything else, it should be able to create a current. Okay, so <clears throat> for the first one, for the first uh, uh, a prediction, now we blocking the the G-protein G-protein signal by putting a GDP beta S, which is a non uh, uh GDP that will blocking the G proteins. And actually, we don't see any changes of the FRIP24 induced current. And, the, and we also use a, a toxin called Petunus toxin that specifically inactivate the, the inhibitory GO. That, and we find that there's no change in, in the effect either. So, it seems like this current is not dependent on a G protein. So the first prediction is, is correct. So now, so that to test the second prediction, we now introduce this, this, this receptor just in the classic oocyte, uh, zero plus oocyte where people generally use for character ion channels. And the prediction is that, so then we ask now if we apply the peptide, could it now get a, in, in, induce a current or not? And the answer is actually very clear, is that just this by applying these two things in these new headlock systems, it could generate a dose-dependent uh, uh, response of the, of, the, of the current. So both of this prediction is correct. So that leads us to believe that this fripper it might likely to, to encode a, a FRIP24 gated ion channel, right? So the question is that what are the ion actually Goes media uh, kind of goes through this channel, and we, we, we think it's uh, mostly depend by the the chloride because when you do the IV curve of this channel by switching the the uh, voltage, we could see by different in the peptide uh, in the in the pipette we use different uh, uh, concentration of chloride. We could see the IV curve actually shifting towards the direction we are predicting. This suggesting in this ion, in this channel, it probably mostly the uh, the chloride chan the chloride ion control the majority of the current because if this is not a case, then these two curves should be roughly in the same place. This is very exciting to us because there so far there hasn't been a, a, a peptide gated chloride channel comb yet. They have report that the peptide can induce the Chloride, ion, uh, chloride current, but no, no protein has been cloned. So this is very interesting to us. So to sum up the first uh, part is that by genetic screen, I show you that 
I'll be able to identify that the peptide actually acting to a likely to be a ligand uh, a receptor to control to control local motion quite in by acting both in the neuron and the muscle. And more importantly, we think we provide very strong evidence suggesting this new gene that we clone is potentially could define a new class of peptide gated ion channel. And indeed, the, this, this group of peptide, the fmi AMI peptide, has been shown in the past a couple of years also regulate sleep in other model systems like flies, zebrafish as well. So it'll be interesting to see if similar inhibitor mechanisms through peptide gated chloride channel also contribute to sleep regulation in our system as well. Okay, so. So, can I ask a question? Yep. When you look at uh, like a mammalian, a, a mouse, or a human genome, mm -hmm. are there any homologs to flipper? Uh, so, f first, uh, no. Uh, it's the, the, the codes, there, there are some homologs inside of one uh, group. And the closest one in other animal we find is from actually from Sosophila, but the, the, the E value actually is pretty big. So it's pretty diverse. So, but I, get, I guess again, the peptide and the receptor generally evolve very rapidly. So that, that, that could be, that is that's, it's not uncommon. Just one more question there. I, I just don't know, do C. elegans have normal gala receptors? Yes, they do, they do. They do. A uh, different uh, chloride channel? No, the, the chloride channels usually when you use the other halides, uh -huh. like bromide or okay. iodine and whatnot, you can affect the permeability. Mm -hmm. You can let more or less current to go through. Right. It's akin to blocking or enhancing the current. Does that affect the behavior? <coughs> so that probably is challenging to do because the warm cuticle is composition of collagen. And it's very hard for like uh, charged things to get through, so that's challenging. But I think one way we could do it is by the physiology way could open up and basically testing the same thing. Does the current is changing by by modifying the the, the ion replacement? But I don't think we have done that yet. Yeah. So because it has gamma transmembrane, that means which side would predict which side is the inside of the cell? Yeah, so, so the current uh, notation in, in the database saying it's, a, it's likely to be a GPCR because the, when we do the prediction, the N terminal actually is outside, the C terminal is inside. Uh, but the fact that the GPCR is so diverse that most likely G, seven transmembrane domain protein are GPCR, but not all. So we think this might be a case where it might somehow during, de during evolution it somehow have a unique uh, feature of this. Does that must have to try to wait for Lance or not? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, so <laughs> for, for narcoleptics, right? Uh -huh. You know, orexin, there's a lack of uh, production of orexin. That's a neuropeptide. And mm. there is, you go into an awake neuropeptic, like the Uzal muscle tone, which is, and you go straight into REM sleep, which is the muscle tone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's, yeah, that's basically, uh, that's, that's what we think it is. Oh, okay. uh, but I guess for one, for, for now, we don't, we, 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 we are, it's less character. Do we have the same different sleep stage as human do, we don't know. But I think molecularly, this, we think the, the muscle atonia, in this case, it might actually happen at both level, not just in a, just shut down the muscle. That might be not sufficient or it's just not reliable. But in this case, it seems like it might shut down both the command neuron that, that make the, the, the animal move and also the executors where the muscle in this case. I mean, the thing is they usually go straight into RAM. Right, really get that right, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, so it's so all good. So now I'll move to the second part to t talk about a technology I developed that I will use for circuit dissection. And the, way I, the reason I do this is, as a, as, a genetics, as a geneticist, I like to know what gene is involved in 
But as a neuroscientist, I also like to map out a circuit so that I could understand how a brain makes the, the, the animal into a sleep state. And again, the warm nerve system so is so simple. In a sense, it has 302 neurons. And each one is basically labeled by a dot here, if you could see it. And all those are the processes. So it's simple, but it's also complicated, in a sense. But again, it, it have a, make it possible that we could dissect the nerve system function at a single cell level. And the straightforward way we could do this is by manipulate the activity of each neurons and see what happened during sleep. Right? So this will, will kind of infer the function of each neuron for sleep. And the complement approach is that we could label each neurons and see the activities during sleep and wake state. And this will also give us hints what neurons are involved in. And now the standard way we could do this by genetic attack neurons in the worm is by this so-called direct promoter gene fusion approach, where now we could fuse the gene of interest. For example, uh, this is a few here. For example, channel adoption that we could use to activate neuron, or histamine coag we could inhibit the neurons. GAP we could label the neurons, or GKM, which is a calcium indicator we could report the activity, and put it under a, a neuron-specific promoter. So then we make a construct, we put it into a worm, then we make sure in general animals, and then we can manipulate the neuron and see what happens behavioral level to infer what the neuron do. While this is very useful to some neuron that have a good promoter we, we could generate access to. So, uh, but it have a limitation where that if a neuron, we don't have a single promoter for it, then we can't generate specific target it. The second, the second limitation is that if we want to do this a systematic way it goes through all the nerve system, it will be very inefficient because we need to make a, a combination of the promoter and gene of interest individually. And to give you a better idea to, to, for this, let's say now we have a neuron. We want to label it with GFP. We want to activate it by channel adoption, and we want to inactivate by histamine chloride. We need to make three constructs or three chain genes. Now if we say we find another three, five neuron that is candidate, then we need to basically make the combination five again. And this could go on and on and on, uh, depending on how many neurons you, uh, that you want, right? And this, in this case, this is an illustration. But they say the number is big. They say, ideally, we want to have a promoter for each of the 302 neurons. And let's just say we want 10 genes. Essentially, it will be more. But in, just in this number, we need th about 3,000 counts right chain gene, and this will take I don't know how many years, but it will take a long time. OK, good. <laughs> so OK. So a better way to do this is demonstrated in, in Drosophila, where they use a bipolar expression system called uh, the gelfo us system. This system originally is identified in the yeast cerevisiae. So the gelfo protein is actually a transcription factor that have a uh, DNA binding domain and activation domain. And it will bind to its target sequence called US to drive the GAL gene expression when the yeast is respond to the galactose. And this system has been uh, well characterized and then engineered to control chain gene expression. And now has been a standard way to do these things in, in the software for circuit dissection. And why this system is much, so the idea here is that that now we decouple the promoter we want and the gene of interest into two components, a driver and effector. And so in either con construct, that nothing was expressed I mean, except the GAL4. But only in the, in the cross progenies where it have both components, the GAL4 will be expressed and then bind to a US sequence and drive the, the expression of the downstream gene in the cell that is dicta dictated by the promoter use. And it, this is much more efficient in a sense because we could do a com 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 combinational crosses, which is much easier to buy, build it by from each one. So the same example as I showed before. Now we just need to make 302 neuron, uh, two drivers, 302 on the, on the left side, 10 effectors, for example, on the right side. Total only 300 things. But it, by crossing, it could make basically exactly the same 3,000. Uh, strains. So that's much, it's almost 10 times less 
uh, uh, more efficient. And if the number going bigger, it will make, make it even more efficient. Despite it's so powerful, it, in the past 20 years, would a warm researcher have tried to make this happen in the field, but it actually never worked in the, in the past 20 years. And when I first started in the lab, I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's just so useful, so I, I, I spent time to systematically engineering a lot of different components in this system, and now actually we make it work very well. And one of the, one of the biggest uh, limitations why it has not been work, we think, is because the original gale force is not robust at all when they're in low temperatures. So give me an idea. So the original gale force, if we try in different temperatures, 25, 20, or 15 in the worms, it actually worked OK at 25 degrees. But in the, the two temperatures, we, always, we use a worm for all the time. It actually does not work, almost. And this is consistent with uh, what people report in a, uh, the soft flow field, where the higher temperature generally make it a uh, higher expression of the gale force. So, but by gen by, so we saw, I solved this problem by, well, the trick I do is find a cool gale force. That means cool that it work at low temperature. And how I can do so? So I reason for any particular gale force from a, any particular uh, uh, east. It probably evolved so that its activity is maximized at the optimal growth temperature of that particular yeast. So, to, so for example, the original gale force is coming from, from a cerevisiae. So the red curve is the temperature dependent growth curve of this yeast. So, so which should have an optimal growth temperature around 30, 30, 30 degree. And this may explain why the original gale force works so well around this temperature, like from 20 to 25, but fail at lower temperatures. All right, so we're mining through all the genome of the, uh, the yeast we have and find a, a cool one. It's a cryophilic yeast. We call it, it's a cruzre vis a vis. So it, it have an optimal temperature around 23, 20, 22, 23. And presumably, we think this probably have a cool gale for that work at low temperature. All right, so we directly compare these two different gale for variants. Uh, by putting under the same promoter, so in this case, we'll drive specific expression in the pharynx and use to drive the same. So this is the notification we use is this driver to use drive the, the, the effector here. And across all three temperatures, you can see that this, this new cool gale force is outperforming the original gale force in, in every aspect, okay? So, this is the big, we think this is one of the biggest uh, engineer we, we make to, to make this system work in one. This together with a few optimization, uh, I, didn't I didn't talk about here because of the time. Uh, so now we name this system as a C-Gal because it's a Gal 4 system made for c agons, And it also uses a cool Gal 4 that actually is cool and it, it work at low temperature. And so now with this bipartisan system in hand, we could do the combination we want before. For example, now if we make a different tissue spectral driver, we could cross into the same effector and we could label pretty much anything we want. In the sense, for example, if we do a muscle or the whole nervous system or a subset of neurons or, or the, 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 the GABA urgent neurons, uh, I mean the glutamatergic neurons. And we could do the other way around too by using the sa same driver and cross different effectors to different things. So again, in here, now we're using a GABAergic GABA driver. Then we drive GAP, so we label all the GABAergic neurons. And we could now cross into a channel of lobstin, which is uh, the white way to activate the neurons. Then we could activate the, the, uh, the GABAergic neurons to make the worm into a paralyzed state because the muscle is all relaxed. And you can see this in this very cool videos. So the worm's crawling around. Once the blue light's on, the worm just like, they don't move. And then once the light off, the worm resumes. So, so, this, so basically, this, this system is robust. It can label cells, can control neurons, can control behaviors. So cool, right? OK. So now we have this great system that allows us to efficiently generate the, the change in we might need to do the circuit mapping. And we would like to make it even better to enhance the specificity of how it could control different neurons. 
And the way we do so is by develop a split Galfo system that with that has an end gate for intersection intersection uh, targeting between two different promoters. The idea the idea here is that we could split the original Galfo into two functional components, the DNA binding domain and activation domain, and each piece attached to an adapter. So each component is not sufficient to drive the effective expression. Only in those cells that both components are there, then the adapter will bring these two pieces together, and it, it will reconstitute the whole protein, and it will drive the, the expression. But in order, to, in order to make this system work, temperature is a thing, the key thing is that we need to find a, a very strong adapter that could make the, the constitution efficient. So if this work actually by mining through all the expression data we have in the worm base, which is the database for worm literature, then pretty much every neural type of the worms can be labeled by the intersection of two promoters. Okay? So, so in order to make this work, we compare three different, th uh, four different adapters, as I listed here. And the name is, doesn't matter, but what, it, what the thing matters is that they're using different mechanisms to bring two pieces together. And you could easily appreciate the last one, which is GP41, the adapter that reconstitutes the best. So this is the original one, and those are the controls, all different, uh, different adapters, and this is a quantification. It could reconstitute re about 70% of the, 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 the original gal for efficiency. And so now we ask, can we use now this split gal for to, to uh, label a cell that before we can't label before, all right? So we pick a cell in a worm called MC neurons, okay? So just a, a two neurons. And now we find, by mining the data, we find two promoters, say 19 and 17, only overlap in this neurons, all right? So we use this two promoter to make a split gal for, and now in the whole animals, we can only see two cells lining up with GFP. So it, could, it, could, it, it, it will allow us to technically, or to label every single neural, neural type in worms. All right, to, so to sum up the second part, is that by systematic engineering a vari variety part of a gal for system, we develop both CGL and split CGL that is robust for worm, and it provides very precise genetic assess or manipulation of the new the, of the entire C uh, nerve system, presumably could be at a single single neuron level. So I'm going to use this for the future work. So in the last few minutes, I would just like to mention a few direction I I'm I'm interested in going in my own lab. And uh, the goal is, again, try to understand sleep in, from multiple aspects. So as a neuroscientist, I would like to, to, find, to define the circuit for this sleep paradigm. As a geneticist, I would like to find origin that's important for this process. And as a, just as a curious, I would like to know what the sleep actually is doing, all right? So to get a, more, a little bit more specific, so coming back to this paradigm I showed before, it's clear that this ALA neuron is important for this stress-induced sleep, but what's the downstream neurons? I know, and does this neuron activate uh, sleep-promoting neuron to promote sleep, or does it inhibit the awake neurons to, 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 to promote sleep? So in order to understand, start to under, understand these questions, I propose to do a, a brain-wide circuit mapping using the split CGL and GAL4 that I developed. So the idea is that we'll now put a worm into a sleep state first, and then manipulate every neuron, uh, every neuron at one at a time and see what happens. And we could do this very efficient by the GAL4 and split GAL4. So we'll have the CGAL drivers, the same set that for each of the neurons, we we'll cross into an inhibitory uh, effector, which is histamine chloride. And in this case, we'll identify the neuron that's important for, for, for sleep, uh, from morning sleep. And conversely, we could cross it into an activation effector. In this case, we'll be able to identify neurons that is sleep promote, uh, awake promoting. And lastly, again, we could cross into a GKM strain so that we could modulate the pattern of activity 
to, to see how the, re the, the real state of neural padding between the two different, uh, between sleep and awake. And this will help to build up the, at least a substrate of, of how sleep is controlled or what are the neurons involved in. And this will, be, will provide a basis that we could further uh, uh, understand how a brain can switch between states. So I'm also interested in identifying what gene is important for sleep. And I will do this in two complement approaches. One, think of it, so one, one, in one scenario, multiple gene might work redundantly to promote sleep. And in this case, loss function will not work very well. So in this case, I'll propose to do gain of function screens, like what I do for the FRIP24 story, the overexpressed gene. But we could actually do it much more efficient again with the CGL system because now we can systematically over the, the same gene in different tissues and see which tissue actually is important. In the second scenario, that a gene single alone might be sufficient, uh, might be important for sleep, right? So in this case, I will I propose to loss of function screen as I show you, for example, the four gene screen that I use to identify the suppressors. And indeed, from a recent screen we do in the lab, we find about 40, we find 44 mutant already, and so we'll be able to, to further characterize how does this mutant, what gene it define, and how does that control sleep. And in the long run, I'll probably bring this to what the gene I identify and, and study how they activate in the circuit to, to control sleep. So in this case, I'll be able to connecting the, the neural basis and the genetic basis together to get a better understanding how sleep is generated. And in the last direction, I want to explore something I would say interesting to me is, so sleep is complicated and most of the time, most of research is depend on the behavioral phenotype that I, sh I described to you or in, in mammalian cells, we'll use the EEG, the electrophysiology phenotypes. And this phenotype definitely is useful for us to, to start to get into sleep, but they probably not represent the whole picture of what sleep state actually is. Uh, so let's say we feel better, there probably something happens that we don't see make us better. So what those are? So I propose to, to generate the molecular phenotype of a sleep state. Okay, so this might provide a new venue that we could, uh, we could approach the sleep. And to do this, I propose to do a systematic RNA sequencing on sleep at both whole animal level or specific tissue level or even single level in worms. And this will be a, general, a, a whole suite of molecules molecule that are changing their expression across a during sleep and awake state. And those will be the, the candidate for the, the potential molecular phenotype of sleep. And, and this we could actually feedback by through functional study to understand how does this phenotype control or contribute sleep by. And we could do this very efficiently because a lot of we have a lot of mutant in worm, or we could easily test them very quickly. Right? And I expect that from this molecular phenotype, we could group into largely two parts. One part would be those would be, might define a regulators that promote a one from a sleep, a wake state to sleep state. That's one part. A second big group would be the scooters of sleep function. So it will help the sleep to achieve the function. So <coughs> by analyzing this, we hope that will, I, I will hope that this will will <coughs> will be able to get 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 a new knowledge about how sleep is, is regulated and what sleep is doing. So to sum, sum up of everything is that the, my, my long-term goal is try to build a complete picture of the neural circuit that underlying sleep and identifying the molecule that acting within them and try to start to get into the core function of what sleep is actually doing. And by solving or understanding how sleep is generated or controlled in the simple model system, it will help us to understand how sleep is, is generated in, in animals that were more complicated, more complicated uh, uh, brain, like, like a mammalian or human. 
and it, which ultimately will, will advance us, our understanding of the conserved biology of sleep. And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my postdoc mentor, Paul Sternberg, and a lot of lab members that contribute some of the work here that I, I talk about, and also some of the work I haven't have a chance to share with you. And I would like to thank our wonderful collaborator, Ping and uh, Zhao Wen, for the, for the recording experiment and the finding resources from NIH and uh, Dana Martin and Howard Hughes. Thank you all. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. Right, so this is a very good question um, because we, so the EGF probably is released, so again, it's a kind of neuromodulatory uh, thing. The answer is unclear um, because EGF is actually is a very important for development. So if you, a complete loss of function is, I think, is lethal. So it's very hard to, 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 to test the, the idea. Like, it's hard, and we are, we are now currently working on try to identify what actually are the tissues that release this signal. Uh, but we think it's probably something directly involved in the environment, probably. Uh, but I think in that way, manipulating the neural activity might not actually give us the hint, because we think the source might not come from neuron. It might come from peripheral tissues. So yeah, but we, we actually are, are try to, to, to address that question. Right. Initiating sleep. Right. Um, is there anything like that? I know C. elegans probably photoperiod is not much of a driver uh, since they don't really experience. So. Um, and, but is there something like that that's some circadian signal that uh, that mimics melatonin to some degree? Yeah. So okay, that's a that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, so first of all, melatonin is probably not the whole story about the circadian. That's one thing. There are other things involving other peptide involving too. Uh, to direct, the, the direct answer is that the one do, they, they probably don't, I, I personally don't think it have a circadian rhythm, even though there's a limit, very one or two people report it. Because the one do not really have an eye, for sure. But they do sense blue light. And so you know why, you could imagine that they might have some, some weak right. ones the in the sunlight, yeah. But they're, they're in a rusted fruit, so it might be filtered out too. So, you, so, but it, so in, 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 that's why I picked this. Uh, <laughs> sorry. That's why I picked this, uh, <laughs> sorry. That's why I picked this, this paradigm. They are in other paradigm where the development induced sleep. It actually depends on the clock gene, the period homolog in worms. But it, act, it cycles. It have, in, in, in a whole life of worm, it have four cycles, the molting cycle. And in that case, the worm sleep. And that's kind of what we, we think is the molecular conservation of the circadian in worm, rather than the really daily rhythms. Yes. I think. Okay, so um, I mean, they've done some stuff in mammals, and there's a lot of features of food waste, which we see as a expression of early toxicity. Right, I'm right. That there be some toxicity changes. So one way is to, I guess, drive these various neurons and um, try to figure out what's going on. Right. Right, so clearly, they're, they're, okay, the, the, one of the, 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 the basis for my proposed dual molecule uh, phenotype is actually, yeah, as you mentioned, there are a few transcriptional studies in mammal or in flies 
and including my, my own pre-normal data, we, sh we do see transcription happening during sleep. But in fly or like in, in, in MEMO, it's just pretty hard to directly testing uh, how does those genes do very efficiently. Plus, I think a lot of those study using a, basically a whole mix of the brain tissue, which obviously contain a lot of different cell types. So that could make things complicated too. But certainly, if, the, if I will probably go through some of those genes, if they have a clear uh, author logs, I could probably quickly test it using the uh, current available C. Eigen, C Eigen, uh mutants. Or if not, I could generate it through uh, uh, CRISPR, which I told Mike that we could get it pretty much every uh, 10, 10 days. We could get the homozygote ready. So certainly, that's one way to do. Uh, but the so, we, we, I'm so, so the function of C we think is, is probably complicated, probably not one thing, that's why I'm thinking. And different tissue might have different second features that we might not be able to get by just whole animal or whole brain. So eventually probably need to get into a single cell uh, sequencing to, to be able to identify those things. Right. Right. So, so, so that I, I guess. Okay. Sorry. I, I guess I kind of misunderstand that part. Um, in worm, because it's transparent, basically we could we could visualize. For example, the synapse that we want, like any particular synapse we want by GAP. So that way we could, for example, do light imaging to see the size of the synaptic, they say, boutons or things are changing, or by, by imaging to see does the response to a particular stimulus is changing too, so that will potentially uh, uh, get to the insight to what sleep might, might change in the plasticity of the particular neurons. Thanks. Ask you, um, I thought it was really interesting how you found something that looked like it would be a GPT. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Be a channel. Yeah. Um, are, have you seen, it's not something I'm familiar with, have you seen other examples of something like that in the worm or in the mammalian system? So, okay, so peptide has been reported to be to be uh, ligand gated, uh, 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 there, there are protein that report to be peptide gated ion channel. But it's a sodium channel, which in, is found in snail and hy hy hydra. Uh, and so this one, so they do go through uh, ion channel, but this, in this case, I'm just showing it's probably like a, a chloride channel, so it's a new class. The second is that in MEMO, I don't think anyone, anyone showed that, or in, 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 in C. agans, no. But in fly, there are older receptors that have semen transmitted domain, and they show it's actually a potential, it's also probably older gated uh, uh, ion channel. But the, the weird thing about that for good protein, it's a ORD8083 or something, I can't remember exactly the name, is that the topology actually is switching. So the N terminal actually is inside, this is uh, the C terminal is outside. So, so we have been very careful about interpretation of the data. But so far, we strongly believe it's probably it's an ion channel, even though I say more bio, biophysic or maybe structure and that will be probably give us a better uh, or definitely answer what is really a ligand gated chloride channel or not. Yeah. It seems like in these worms, the sleep is a binary thing. They're either asleep or awake. But in humans, it seems like you know we're, we're going through various stages of sleepiness and sleep drive gets stronger and Right, so that's why I think, that's why I say there's the differences between different models and their similarities. Um, but in the worm, okay, the, the way I show you here is just more global state. But w when people do, when other group doing more uh, detailed characterization over the course of the sleep state, they actually find the worm actually go in and out, in and out. So they have a very 
quiet, quiescent bolt and then come up, maybe wake a little bit, or maybe they're dreaming of real good food, I don't know. <laughs> but they all get back into sleep. So they, they do have those cycles changes. And they, f they do find genes kind of affecting the length of the, those particular belt. But I think those are very, kind of very hard to quantify because you need to use a computer vision to quantify those subtle changes. But I do believe that probably something happening that, that, that we need to understand. But I, th I guess getting the whole picture first will, be, will basically have, will provide the opportunity that we get into more detail and as later on. Right. Right. So now. Right. So yeah. So that that is actually something we're really hoping to do for to do unconstrained worm whole brain imaging. Yeah. That would be nice. But so far, it's just been very hard, even though there's only 300 tuneons, but as you, the diagram I showed, they're all clustered very dense in the head. So it's very hard to proceed through the, those things. And so nowadays, most, most of the time, we only label a subset of neurons so that we could characterize that activity during sleep and awake. And a lot of time, the neuron we could approach now so far using a direct fusion approach, mostly is the, the upstream, like sensory neurons. We can't really assess a lot of interneuron, which I think to me, to me is doing the computational doing in those state. And I hope that with the sprig L4 I have, I could try to get, start to getting into those, the command neuron in the middle, and those might have very, very useful features to define maybe a certain different stage of sleep. Yeah. I think that'd be a robust way to yes, it. yes, for sure. Okay, we should probably end Sorry. so that people can. It's all right. Yeah. All right, thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.